Now listen, has someone in your life ever challenged you? Has someone in your life ever challenged you? Maybe someone challenged you to a competition to see who was the best. Maybe you were in school and a teacher challenged you to be a better student. Rekindled Church would like to invite you to a House of Pearls benefit concert. Featuring the Conviction Notice Band. Saturday, September 24th at 6 p.m. at the Albemarle Parks and Recreation Building at 1816A East Main Street in Albemarle, North Carolina. For more information, please visit www.rekindledchurch.com. Hello and welcome to Rekindled Church. We have a few announcements for you this morning. Remember, September 24th, is our benefit for the House of Pearls. We are looking forward to that. It's going to be great. If you haven't signed up to help or if you haven't bought a ticket, we encourage you to do so this morning. We will have sign-up sheets, and we will also have QR codes where you can purchase a ticket. Uh, also, remember, in October, yes, it's hard to believe summer is about over. In October, we are going to be doing our annual uh, Halloween outreach. It's the best time of year uh, for pe to tell people about Jesus. Uh, as we'll be doing that most likely on October 31st on Halloween. It'll be a great night to, of outreach and telling folks about the Lord. Also, uh, remember in November, uh, we're going to be doing a Friend Sunday in November. That's right, a Friend Sunday. If there's one thing we should be thankful for around Thanksgiving, it is a, uh, the one thing we should be thankful for at Thanksgiving, guess what? It should be our friends. So we want to uh, do a Friends Sunday in November, and we will make that date a little more tentative as it comes close. Uh, also, in December, yes, December, can you believe we're already talking about Christmas? Uh, we are going to be doing a uh, Christmas service, of course, but also we're going to be doing Christmas outreach. If you know families that are in desperate need of help um, and just need a hand up, not a handout, please let us know so we can go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus with them. And I just want you to know hey, how much I love you, how much I care about you. Uh, thank you for working alongside uh, of me and everybody else in the church, uh, it, it means a whole lot. And just know this, that I love you, and Jesus does too. Need to John chapter 8, John chapter 8, while you're turning there, we'll be in verses 48 through 59. Now listen, has someone in your life ever challenged you? Has someone in your life ever challenged you? Maybe someone challenged you to a competition to see who was the best. Maybe you were in school and a teacher challenged you to be a better student. See, challenges are not bad things. In fact, challenges often push us to see a greater truth. <clears throat> As we continue in chapter 8, we see that Jesus challenged the religious rulers of his day. Let's not forget that Jesus and his word still challenged those who oppose him. He also challenges his followers when they're out of line. The crucial thing is how you respond when Jesus challenges you. Do you get defensive and hostile at these, like these Jews did? See, the result of that, of that response, the result uh, 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 of hostility towards Christ means to die in our sins. 
But Jesus says, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. To state it in another way, those who believe in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. They'll be saved. So if you would please take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 8, 48 through 59, and we examine the responses to the challenge of Christ. Responses to the challenge of Christ. So we'll begin in verse 48. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Verse 57. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. In responding to the challenges of Jesus, first we see the dishonoring response. We see the dishonoring response. These Jewish leaders were outraged by Jesus calling them children of the devil. Could you imagine someone being angry at you? When you looked at them and said, hey, you're children of the devil. <laughs> Therefore, they lashed out at Christ by saying, we are not right in saying that you, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? These men were trying to insult and discredit Christ. These Samaritans were half Jew and half Gentile. These Jews looked at Samaritans as dirty and nasty. These Jews despised them as physical and spiritual half-breeds. By calling Jesus a Samaritan, the Jewish leaders were in effect labeling him a false teacher and a traitor to Israel. Wow. These self-righteous Jews did not have ears to hear what Jesus was saying. They did not believe or accept the fact that they were children of the devil. Therefore, if nothing was wrong with them, it must be Jesus that is wrong. They did not stop with calling Christ a Samaritan. They thought, hey, we're just going to call you a half-breed and insult you. They took it a step further. So you're a half-breed and you're demon-possessed. This was not the first time they had made an outrageous statement like this. In Mark 3, 22, the scribes accused Jesus of being possessed by Beelzebub. They said he cast out demons on behalf of Beelzebub. Now you tell me if that makes sense. In John 70, 20, the crowd answered, You have a demon who seeks to kill you. 
Later in the Gospel of John, we will see Jesus accused of being demon-possessed and they called him insane. Wow. However, notice that Jesus did not even reply to their malicious accusations. Notice, notice what Jesus did. He did not raise his voice. He did not scream. He did not yell. But yet he remained calm, he remained cool, and he remained collected. These religious leaders were trying to provoke a negative response so they could discredit Jesus even more. Jesus was slow to speak, and guess what? He was slow to anger. Jesus calmly answered these religious rulers by saying this, I do not have a demon. That's pretty straightforward, right? I do not have a demon, but I honor my father. Wow. I do not have a demon, but I honor my father. A demon-possessed man cannot honor God the Father. That's right. Jesus honored God the Father because he is one with the Father. Let's not forget that Jesus said, when you look upon me, you look upon the Father. For I and the Father are one. The actions of Jesus honored the Father. Jesus healed the blind. He made the lame walk. He cast out demons. He fed over 5,000. He offered living water and the bread of life to those who were spiritually hungry. He looked at sinners. And He said, sin no more. Sin no more. These are not the actions of a demon-possessed man, but his actions prove that he honored his father. See, the word honor in this verse is a present tense action verb. In other words, Jesus is saying that even in the present situation, he was honoring the father. Even in the present situation he was in, even during these accusations and these malice accusations towards him, he was honoring the Father. And not only, guess what? That present tense still takes active today. God still, Jesus still honors the Father. Even today. Because these religious rulers dishonored Christ, they were dishonoring the very God they claim to serve. Notice what Jesus said. I do not have a demon, but I honor my father. Notice this. And you dishonor me. Wow. Let us not forget what Jesus had already told this group of people in John 8, 42. If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come of my own initiative, but he sent me. Only those who honor Christ will be honored in return. Jesus did not come to this world to seek his own glory. If Christ had wanted to seek glory, then he just should have stayed in heaven. Jesus did not come to seek his own accolades, but instead he came to seek and to save the lost. He came to hear the sins of men. He came to save and bear the sins of many to save his people from their sin. Jesus left His throne of heaven to fulfill the plan of redemption. Christ came as a humble servant. However, in the last half of verse 50, this is what Jesus said. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Even though Jesus did not come to seek his glory, the Father seeks honor for the Son. Jesus said that God the Father judges. Those who do not honor the Son will be judged. Those who do not honor the Son will be judged. Amen. In verse 51, Jesus made a promise to those who would honor and obey him through salvation. For those who trust in Jesus Christ, this is His promise. Truly, truly, I say to you, 
If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Man. Once again, Jesus used the words, truly, truly. He was saying, amen, amen. In other words, he was saying, let it be, let it be. In other words, he was about to make a true defining statement. He was saying, hey, you scribes, Pharisees, all you religious church people, pay close attention. Jesus was telling this group of religious Jewish leaders that those who keep his word are true children of God. He was saying that those who believe in him and trust in him by faith are part of his kingdom. In other words, they're his true disciples. Amen. Those who listen and have a hunger for the things of God are truly his disciples. And they will never experience the torments of hell. In this statement, Jesus still offered eternal life to those who rejected his gospel and dishonored him. Is that not grace? Is that not mercy? That God offers salvation even to those he knows will reject it. Even those who don't want anything to do with Him, He still offers it. The gift of salvation. Amen. Listen, there are still people today that respond to the challenge of Christ with dishonor. They think they have rightly assessed Jesus, but they end up dishonoring Him. For instance, there are cults that rob Jesus of his deity, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, like the Mormons. And many today believe that Jesus was nothing more than a, a great teacher or a great prophet. A few years ago, the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown popularized the notion that Jesus secretly married Mary Magdalene and fathered a child by her and was skillfully covered up by the church. Hmm. These are just small samplings of many provi uh, pr provisions and misjudgments of the character and person of Christ that are circulating the globe today. Jesus says that those who hold or perpetuate these false claims dishonor Him. They dishonor Him. These Pharisees and scribes were dishonoring Christ yeah. by their accusations. By calling Him a half-breed. By calling Him demon-possessed. This is the God of the universe. And they were calling Him crazy things. My friends, it still happens today. People are calling Jesus a lunatic. They are calling Him crazy. They are calling Him uh, uh, just a good moral teacher. If you entertain any unbiblical notions, ideas, and theories about Christ, you dishonor Him. In other words, whatever little God you got made in your head, if it's not based on the Bible and off the Scriptures. Not what you think or your opinion. Then you're dishonoring God. If, you, if your concept of Him is based on some legend, a fable, or a story you read outside the Bible, you dishonor Christ. If you want to honor Christ, we must respond to Him in the right way way we must respond to him in humility and obedience and repentance as the scripture commands see the first response to the challenge of Christ was a dishonoring response the, the second response to, challenging, to, to the challenge of Christ is a doubting response in verses 52 through 58 we read the Jews said to him now we know that you have a demon Abraham died as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father 
Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him, and I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. See, the reason these religious rulers responded with a doubtful heart is because they did not possess faith. They were looking at Christ through physical eyes and not spiritual eyes. Therefore, they said, you must be crazy. You're nuts. You're out of your mind. Those who do not have ears to hear the word of God will be filled with anger. They will be filled with doubt. Let's not forget that Jesus was addressing the scribes and Pharisees. These were men who prided themselves in being men of faith. But instead of believing and trusting in Christ, they responded to Him by saying, Now we know that you have a demon. These were religious people. These were church people. But yet they did not see Christ for who He is. Let's make this clear. These religious rulers were not confused about who Jesus claimed to be. They were not confused. But they were in plain denial. Plain denial. They understood that Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world. However, Jesus did not measure up to their expectations and therefore they felt threatened by His presence. They even tried to use Christ's words against him by saying, Abraham died as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? In other words, they were saying, just who do you think you are? Just who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You're no better than Abraham. You're no better than the prophets. Abraham died. The prophets died. And guess what? You're going to die too. At the end of the day, these religious rulers were afraid of losing their power. And they were afraid of losing their prestige. You know, that's most of the reasons why people don't want to know Jesus. They don't want to give up their power and they don't want to give up their prestige. They care more about the honor of men than they do about the honor of God. These, the reasons they doubted Jesus were purely self-motivated. However, Jesus replied to these rulers in a calm and patient manner. Again, what was he? He was calm, cool, and collective. And noted what he said. If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our God. Jesus' claims were not those of a demon-possessed man or a crazed maniac because the glory he possesses was not evil or satanic. The glory in which Christ possessed was divine. The glory of Christ came from where? God the Father. The very God they claimed to know and serve. The very God whom the Jewish leaders said, He is our God. These self-righteous religious leaders claimed to love God, but they rejected Jesus as the Son of God. Because of this, Jesus plainly told them, they do not know God. Do you know how many people we encounter in our world today who claim to love God? 
If you were to go up to the average individual in this county and ask them the question, do you love God? They're going to tell you, yeah, I love God. Go to the drug addict. Go to the drug addict. Go to the alcoholic. Go to the people dealing with substance abuse. Walk up to them and ask them, do you love God? You know what I'm going to tell you? Oh, yeah, I love God. I love God. Oh, but my friends, listen to me. But because they fail to submit to Christ, their lifestyle shows that they hate Him. Yeah. Because they do not live for Him, they're saying, really, I hate you. That's what they're saying. I hate you. Even in our culture today, with, in our Bible Belt, with people in the church who sit there and say, I love Jesus. But what they do on Sunday don't match what they do on Monday. That's right. They don't really love Jesus. They don't. My friends, listen to me. Before we give these Pharisees such a hard time, we need to look at ourselves. We've all been at this point at some point in our lives. Before we knew Christ, we were just like Him. We went around saying, oh, I love God, but we were dead in our sin. We were all dead in our sin. But in verse 55, Jesus said this, but you have not known him. In other words, Jesus is further saying this, you don't know him because you are of your father, the devil. That's the reason you don't know him. You don't know him because you are of your father, the devil. Now the word know in the Greek means to properly see with physical eyes. And it can also mean to be open to spiritual truth. Jesus is saying that he has been physically present with God. Wow, think about it. Jesus is saying, I have been physically present with God. I know God. I have been physically present with Him. Since Jesus is one with God, since He is one with God the Father, how could He not know the Father? Yeah. In this verse, we see the truth of the character of Christ. Notice what He said. He cannot lie. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that Jesus can't lie? Jesus cannot lie. Christ goes a step further and he says, I would not be a liar like you. Mm. Woo! Man, that stings. He says, I would not be a liar like you. They were liars because they claimed to know God when they actually did not. They claimed to know God when they actually did not. Christ maintained the truth of His divine nature with the Father, although it was the very issue that these Jewish leaders sought to murder Him over. In verse 56, Christ refers back to knowing Abraham. That's what He says. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and he was glad. Wow. He saw it and he was glad. The literal interpretation of this verse reads like this. This is the literal Greek interpretation of this verse. Abraham, your father, was transported with an excluded desire that he should see my day and saw it and rejoiced. This is the literal Greek interpretation. Listen to this again. Abraham, your father, was transported with an excluded desire that he should see by day and saw it and rejoiced. <laughs> oh, this is good. What exactly was Abraham transported to see? What made him rejoice? He was transported to see the cross. He was transported. 
to see Christ crucified, resurrected, and he rejoiced. The next question is, how did Abraham see the death of Christ? How did he see it? First, Abraham saw the death of Christ by faith in the promise of God. In fact, Hebrews 11, 13 says it like this. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised. Oh, listen to this. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the Old Testament saints. He's saying these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them, listen to this, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. What do we see? The same faith that saves us today as believers saved Abraham. The same faith that saves me today, that saves you today, saved Abraham. It saved Isaac. It saves Jacob. Second, we said Abraham saw the death of Christ in a type. When God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his only son Isaac and receiving him back, he was giving Abraham a live example of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Third, we see that Abraham saw Christ through special revelation. People wonder how people were saved in the Old Testament. I told you, the same way they're saved today. They were saved through the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were looking to the cross. We look back to the cross. Psalms 25, 14 says this. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. Old Testament. The secret of the Lord. What is that? Special revelation of God. In fact, oh, hold on. If you look in the ESV translation, the, that, 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 that first part of it, it says there instead of saying the secret of the Lord, it says friendship. The friendship of the Lord causes people to fear. You know what that means? It is a personal relationship, a friendship, a special revelation of God. You know how King David was saved? Did you know that King David actually prophesied the crucifixion? Did you know that King David should have been put to death for everything that he had done? But yet God called him a man after his own heart. Why? Because David repented and never did it again. David broke every one of the Ten Commandments. He should have died. Should have been put to death. Why didn't God kill him? I'll tell you why. Because David saw the cross. We see that David prophesied the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And God honored the fact that he saw the cross. That Jesus died and He was resurrected. Oh, my friends. Abraham knew the secret of the Lord. He knew that Jesus was going to die on the cross and be resurrected. And guess what? Abraham rejoiced. However, we see that these Jewish leaders responded once again. Look at how these Jewish leaders responded with this statement of Christ. They doubted. They doubted. In verse 57 they said, So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you have, not, and, and you have seen Abraham. Abraham had lived more than a millennium early. So in this faithless, doubtful minds of these Jewish leaders, they thought it impossible for Jesus to know Abraham. They failed to see Christ as eternally existent. Wow. They simply saw him as an average man limited to time and space. They failed to see what Abraham saw. They failed to see Christ for who he is, just like Abraham. 
Abraham saw Christ as God made flesh. Wow. In verse 58, Jesus made this climactic statement. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> this is good stuff. In this statement, Jesus is saying, I am the one who spoke this world into existence. I am the one who breathed life into Adam and Eve. I am the one who promised a redeemer. One commentator says this, by using the timeless I am rather than I was, Jesus conveyed not only the idea of his past existence, but his present existence. My friends, listen to me. Jesus is still the I am. He has not changed. He is still the great I am. Just like he was with Abraham, just like he was in the New Testament, and just like he is today, he is still the great I am. However, even when Christ made a bold declaration, Jesus, these Jews were still in doubt. Listen. Jesus was so plain that a blind man could see it. I mean, he did not beat around the bush. He was very straightforward. He was pretty to the point. These people and these religious rulers were not confused about who Christ was. They knew exactly what he was saying. But yet, they looked at him with doubt and unbelief. There are still people today who respond to Christ in doubt. Even when the truth of his divinity is proclaimed, people still walk. They walk away doubting his word. Or better yet, they just walk away and don't care. In a nutshell, that's what these men did. They heard Christ's words and simply did not care. Did not care. The point is, Jesus' claims are so radical that either he was a deluded, crazy man or he was exactly who he claimed to be. His claims are backed up by many scriptures that he fulfilled by his sinless life, by his many miracles, by his resurrection from the dead. This is why we can trust in his promise and whoever keeps his word will never see death. Listen, are you doubting him this morning or has the Lord opened your eyes by faith? Are you doubting him? Here's the question. How are you living your life? That'll tell you. Do you live for him or against him? Simple. When we see Christ for who he truly is and submit to his authority, listen to us, all doubt is erased. All doubt is erased. The first response to the challenge of Christ was dishonor. The second response to the challenge of Christ was doubt. The third response to the challenge of Christ was was defiant. In verse 59 we read, so they picked up stones to throw at him. These Jewish leaders understood exactly what Jesus is saying. Like I said, they were not idiots. Instead of trusting in Christ and being excited about the Redeemer coming to the earth, they responded to him with hatred and they responded to him with violence. Oh, because they did not see the spiritual truth of Christ, they consider His words to be blasphemy. Yeah. Listen, when you find out the God you have made up in your mind is not what the Scripture says, it's going to make you mad. It's going to make you angry. It's going to make you doubt. Therefore, they took the law into their own hands. And what did they do? They tried to kill Him. Huh. 
These were men who claimed to love God and believe in God, but yet they wanted God dead. Hmm. Oh, my friends, people still re respond with defiance towards Christ today. People hate Christ for who He is and who He claims to be. There are people in churches and, and even walking on the streets of our community who claim to know God and love God, but they, but they respond to Christ with defiance. Let's not forget that before any of us came to know Christ, we also responded to Him with a rebellious heart. We all had a defiant heart. It has been said that the average believer heard the gospel ten times or more before coming to know Christ. How many times did you have to hear the gospel before it took? I got to tell you this story. I got a friend of mine. This made my week. Made my week. I got the video. I wish I thought about it. Put it up on the screen. I worked with this man for 20 years. Five years at Food Line. 25 years. We were close friends. But look, I loved him. I still love him today. I still go by to see him and check on him. We go have lunch. He was more than just a boss man. He was a friend. But I want to tell you, he was a great boss. Still is a great boss. But he was lost. He was lost. For 25 years of working with him, I prayed for him. And it wasn't just me. His wife prayed for him. A friend of ours named Larry prayed for him. Jimmy Anderson, another friend of mine, prayed for him. And I got a phone call. We presented the gospel over and over and over and over and over again. Last Thursday, I got a phone call from him. And he says, Wilson, I got something I got to tell you. He says, what? It finally took. And he sent me a video of him getting baptized. Amen. And he says, Wilson, I haven't, I haven't been able to quit smiling. He says, if I knew, if I had known what this was like, I'd have done it a lot earlier. He said, but God's timing is perfect. I got news for you. Listen to this. Uh, th this man had a filthy mouth. Cussed like a sailor. I just got to brag on the Lord. Amen. I was on the phone with him for an hour. You don't understand. To be with this man and talking to him for an hour without profanity is a miracle. Without any use of profanity is a miracle of God. Listen to me. When we witness to people, look for years he would not want to hear a thing I had to say or anybody else. He had a defiant attitude. We all had them before we came into Christ. But it's Christ who takes hold of our heart and he, he, he unshackles the chains. He sets us free. However, Jesus said that these religious rulers were children of Satan and were going to die in their sin. Oh, wow. Jesus has already said, you are going to die in your sin. Not maybe or yet, might. He said you were going to. The stones they had in their hands reflected their hard heart towards the gospel. Listen, are you wrestling with the truth of God this morning? If you are, I'm telling you, that's a good sign. If you're wrestling with Him, that's a good sign. When you're wrestling with God, it's a good sign. I'll tell you what that means. It means you're His. Amen. If you're not His, there's nothing to wrestle with. 
When we quit fighting the truth of God, we can embrace the truth of His grace and mercy towards us. Defiance is nothing more than straight up rebellion. Listen, are you clenching your fist at God this morning or are your arms wide open? Maybe this might be the, the first time, the second time, the 25th time, the 100th time you've heard the gospel. Maybe it'll take this. Maybe it'll take. The third response to challenge of Christ was defiance. The fourth response to the challenge of Christ is disappearance. In verse 59 we read, So they picked up stones to throw at Him, but Jesus hid Himself and went out of the temple. Jesus responded to their defiance by supernaturally disappearing. Oh, this is going to preach. Let's not forget that in the book of Ezekiel, that the presence of God left the temple. And the people did not even notice it. We see in our text that Jesus, the earthly presence of God, left the temple. And the Jewish leaders did, even, did not even notice who he was. What a horrific thing to happen in your life. God just simply disappears. Mm. In this instance, we see a foreshadowing of God's judgment. For it is in hell that men and women are eternally separated from God. If you are here this morning and you see Christ for who He is, then praise Him. Praise Him. Because the only way you know who God is is because He showed it to you. The only way you have a desire to live for Him is because He put it in you. The only reason you know the truth and the truth that sets you free is because He showed it to you. But you can have all the knowledge in the world and still split hell out of it. You can know about Him all day long. But if you don't live for Him, then you'll spend eternity in hell. However, if you're here this morning, you simply don't care about the Christ, who He is, and it's a possibility that He has disappeared from your life. What a horrific thing that is. For God to disappear from one's life. When we read about the churches of Revelation. And we read about God writes above one of the church. The glory has departed. You know what that means? It means that people are in the church going through all the motions, doing all the stuff but they don't even realize he's left. They're doing all the religious things, but they don't even realize he's gone. He simply just disappeared. Oh, wow. For God to lift his hand and say, I'm done. I'm done. With these religious rulers that were under the sound of the voice of Christ, he was looking at them and he was saying, I'm done. You've heard everything I gotta say, I'm done. And he simply disappears. Listen, how will you respond this morning to the challenge of Christ? There are only two possible ways. Two possible ways. Either you see him as Lord, or you see him as a crazy man. Either Christ will make you glad, he's going to make you, or he'll make you mad. Either we fall to our knees in submission, 
or we continually go through our life and maybe there's the possibility that God just disappeared from your life. Listen, you can accept Christ as Savior. Bow before Him in humility, repentant faith, confess Him as Lord of your life. Or you can reject Him and be separated from Him forever. How will you respond? How will you respond this morning? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you and thank you for who you are, for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for calling us out. We thank you for sharing truth, for opening up our eyes to who you are. Lord, I pray if there's someone here today that, that is struggling with you, that maybe knows the truth, knows it in their head, but it hasn't made it to their heart. I pray that God, only you can do that. We pray that, Lord, you would save them, change them, make them new. Lord, in your precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're here this morning and you want to talk to someone about salvation or got questions about that, just feel free to come to us and talk to me. And um, I believe this. Whenever I share the gospel with folks, I take my time. Um, so one reason I don't give a whole lot of altar calls a lot of times is because when it comes to sharing the gospel and really wanting people to understand, when people walk down, that just ain't enough time. And so I like, I like to be able for people to understand what's going on and try to explain it. And so that's one reason. So if you want to be able to come to me and if you're interested, talk to me. Hey, look, I'll, I'll stop what I'm doing and we will talk with no, no questions asked. So just know that. Know this too, that I love you and Jesus does too. All right?